fundamental particles. And these little fun toys, they're just some of the particles that we think are fundamental. That means they can't be divided again. That means they're the most basic building blocks of matter. They go together and are grouped into a group of particles which you know as of as the particle zoo. You've probably done the cheese cutting fort experiment. Well, that's an idea from ancient Greece. And the Greeks called anything that couldn't be divided again atoms. They thought atoms were fundamental. Now, chemistry developed and we got the Dalton model of the atom. Dalton said, well, atoms are split into different groups. They're called the elements and they can all kind of link onto each other. And later we realized that they were sharing or donating charge. And we came up with the Thompson plum pudding model. And you'll probably remember from your GCSE that then Rutherford came along and did his scattering experiment and found out that actually there was a nucleus, a small positively charged nucleus where the mass was concentrated. That's called the nuclear model. Well, the model that you're most familiar with, though, is actually one step further than that. It's actually Bohr's model. You probably did not know it was called Bohr's model. Or maybe you did. And that's the model that in the nucleus we have positive things, which we call protons, and we have negative things, which we call neutrons, and that they are orbited by these little electrically charged particles, which we call electrons. And they have certain energy levels. That's slightly higher than GCSE. Perhaps from last year, you remember, they have discrete energy levels, energies which they have in their orbits, and they can move between these orbits. It was thought that the proton and the neutron were themselves fundamental particles, meaning they couldn't be split apart. But during the experiments, we did find that they were in fact made of two smaller particles called quarks. And we gave the name the up quark and the down quark to the two particles that make the massive nucleons in atoms. They tried then to split up the electron and found that no, in actual fact, the electron could not be split into anything smaller. So it got its place in this kind of new physics periodic table, a new table of everything there is, a new table of everything that makes everything else. And they discovered a particle, a partner particle to the electron. It was like an electron, a little bit smaller and with no charge. They called it the electron neutrino. These two particles were a lot lighter than quarks, so they were given a different name, the name leptons. This is what we call the first generation of matter. It is the four particles that make up most of the matter that we see around us. And I have already told you that up quarks and down quarks make up protons and make up neutrons. We'll come back to how these things are made up, but very quickly, here's the composition, the what we call the quark composition of the proton and of the neutron. A proton is two up quarks and one down quark. A neutron is two down quarks and one up quark. Now, you need to know just one quantity and remember just one quantity about quarks, and that is their charge. You'll need to be able to kind of compare their masses, but you'll only need to remember just one quantity. You'll need to remember the up quark has a charge of two thirds. That is relative to the overall charge on a proton. The down quark has a charge of minus one third. So therefore, that means these add up to an overall charge of one. These add up to an overall charge of zero. So 
So then just the last two charges in the first generation of matter, electron is easy, doesn't change, that's a fundamental particle, it's minus one, and the neutrino is the little neutral one, so its charge is zero. That's it for the first generation. Now, there was a discovery of the next generation, the second generation of matter. And every particle in the first generation has a partner particle, has a symmetrical particle in the second generation. And they invented names for them. This is the charm particle. And this was the strange particle. Can you guess which was discovered first? Well, when they found the strange particle, they said, what's this strange particle? Hence the name. And they were pretty perplexed by it until they found its symmetrical partner. And they thought, well, that is charming. The charm and the strange work very similar uh, to the up and the down, but they have much more mass. So the charges are the same, but their mass is much greater. And therefore, we do not see them in most of what most of the matter that we observe around us at the relatively low energies at which we live. Well, physicists figured there must be a symmetrical group of leptons. And yes, they were absolutely right. This more massive than electron, but very similar, given the symbol mu, is the muon. And its little neutral particle is the muon neutrino. And yes, you've probably guessed the charges on them are the same as the first generation of leptons. Well, at even higher energies, you guessed it, they found the third generation of matter. And these, you'll need to know the names and their charges, are the top and the bottom quark. Now, they have the same charges as their partners in the previous generations. Interestingly, they have other names. They have the name truth and beauty rather than top and bottom. And that's because the beauty particle may have an awful lot to say about why we're here in a universe made mainly of matter rather than antimatter. And in studying that, the physicists would rather have been called beauty physicists rather than bottom physicists. And they predicted and then found a symmetrical group of particles in the lepton family and they called that the tau and the tau neutrino. Same story with regards charge, minus one tau, no charge neutrino. Okay, so that's fine. That's most of the particles that make up all of the stuff with matter with low energy and low mass first generation a little bit more energy and mass we've got the second generation and at the high energies the high mass we've got these particles the third generation but well why do they interact well in physics interacts interactions happen because of forces and there are four fundamental forces and so far we've discovered the mechanisms to three of those fundamental forces and we found that they are governed by things called bosons not bosons bosons uh, sometimes referred to as gauge gauge bosons or exchange bosons um, the first fundamental force and one of the most important ones is the strong force and that is carried by the G boson, the gluon. Gluon is a chargeless particle, but you won't really need to worry too much about that. It is the thing which keeps the quarks together in their um, nucleons or their other hadrons. Now, by far the most uh, influential in your life fundamental force, and most of what you ever do will be carried by this gauge boson, the photon. That is the boson for the fundamental force, electromagnetic force. 
And then the last one that we understand, or, or anywhere near understanding, is the weak nuclear force. And that is carried by the neutral particle Z and the two charged particles W plus and W minus. So there's actually two in here. Now, just recently in 2013, there was confirmed the final piece of these, this puzzle, except to mention that there's also the missing piece, why does gravity happen? People have theorized graviton or strings, loads of different theories. The reality is we just don't know what causes gravity. But, well, most of these interactions happen because all of the particles, including themselves, have mass. So we need a particle which allows there to be a field on which things feel mass, which causes mass. And that particle was proposed, amongst others, by Peter Higgs and is called the Higgs boson, or sometimes the Higgson. It's to a chargeless particle. It was the piece that confirmed this model which we know as the standard model. So we're happy with our model of everything that makes up everything, everything that makes up matter, the standard model, the particles that make up everything in the universe. Well, we were happy with it to a point. We were happy with it until an interesting little footnote into one of Dirac's equations was investigated and predicted something which carried on the theme of symmetry. Every single particle in the standard model had its own symmetrical partner. And we call that stuff, the stuff that's the opposite of stuff, we call that antimatter. The notation for matter is as follows, U, and if it's the antimatter particle um, equivalent of its antimatter partner, it has a little line over the top. So this is an up quark, this is an anti-up quark. This would be a down, this would be an anti-down. I really hope that helped, guys. Thanks very much.